Um, Ajay, it's a true pleasure to have you in this series. And I am dying to find out which of several different stories you're going to tell today. So without further ado, over to you, Ajay. Uh, thanks, Ray. Uh, thanks, Ray and Arit as well for putting together this fantastic series and for including me among all these speakers. Uh, I hope I can say something useful today, but if not, at least I hope to be entertaining. So that's my bar. Um, so if I consider kind of my overall trajectory, uh, you know, I would characterize it as less as some sort of single-minded, you know, uh, determination to get to a fixed goal, but, you know, more like a biased random walk where there are chance occurrences and, you know, I take advantage and make small actions to take local advantage of those occurrences. And I think that's probably reflected in many people's lives, but you know, that's somewhat more true for me, I think. So, uh, so keeping that in mind, I'll start with my early years. And so I came into this world uh, in a country, a friendly not neighborhood country to the North. Uh, I was born into a family of academics, uh, it's my mom and dad here, and they're both uh, postdocs in chemistry at the time. Uh, <clears throat> now my parents' uh, kind of histories have always been an inspiration for me, uh, and especially that of my dad, because uh, he uh, went through a lot. He started off, you know, uh, he was the first generation high school grad, and he started off from a small farm and made it all the way to the being a fellow of the National Academy in India. So. He had to face a lot of barriers throughout his life, including economic, obviously, but also you know, caste-based barriers. So that's uh, truly inspiring kind of stories for both of them. Uh, and the picture to the right here, I mean, I could say that this was a reflection of my admiration for my dad, but more like it was in, you know, my admiration for a theorist's way of life. And I pretty much look like that now, uh, minus the pipe, of course, and with an Apple pencil uh, standing in for the real pencil there. So that's what has changed since then. Um, so my formal schooling, I was actually mostly in India and it was in a school situated on the campus of the Indian Institute of Technology in Chennai, which is known as Madras then. Uh, and uh, incidentally, it was also, a, happened to be part of a national forest reserve. And as you can tell from kind of the monkeys and deer that you can see here, there's pictures of campus. Um, and I sh should mention that, you know, this has been kind of a common theme throughout my life, my encounters with wildlife. Uh, and I've, you know, have had encounters with monkeys, obviously deer, but also pythons, bears and dolphins. And they typically end in kind of utter humiliation for me. So if you're interested in hearing these stories, you can talk to me later. Uh, but the school itself uh, was called, and that's me standing in front of the school there called Vanavani. Uh, which quite poetically means voice of the forest and it's quite appropriate there. And uh, it's kind of one claim to fame in terms of alumni is this person here that many of you recognize as a Sundar Pichai, uh, you know, who owns most of our information currently. So um, in terms of academics, I was always interested in mathematics. So, you know, I did the usual, you know, mathematics talent tests, I, you know, wrote the Olympiads and so on. But it was really physics that kind of captivated my imagination. Uh, and it was probably spurred by my reading of kind of popular science books like The Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking that had just come out around that time and The Character of Physical Law by Richard Feynman. These two were kind of impactful. And I felt like uh, you know, the fact that you could use mathematics to describe reality was pretty powerful to me and pretty exciting. And so, thinking about majors for uh, college, you know, physics was my top choice. And uh, so I decided to go to the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, which was reputed to be one of the best undergraduate educations in India. And uh, yeah, I should mention that, uh, you know, choosing to do physics uh, uh, after having gotten admission into an Indian Institute of Technology, instead of more lucrative or employable engineering, you know, generated a lot of criticism from a lot of acquaintances. But, you know, physics, I couldn't really imagine doing anything else. So physics it was. 
uh, also given that my other option was majoring in literature. So physics was actually a much more lucrative option. So that it was fine. And my parents were very supportive of that. And so that worked out quite well. I really enjoyed my time at, the, at IIT. Uh, also more wildlife, monkeys and peacocks. Uh, but I enjoyed my classes, had a great time, but it was still, I think it was in my third year that I've, when I first took my first class in statistical mechanics with Professor Devishri Chaudhary that I really fell in love with kind of a subfield of physics and, you know, the idea of ensembles and the idea that you can write down exact, you know, um, equations describing the macroscopic properties of systems simply based on property distributions. Uh, was kind of mind blowing for me at that time. And so I went and talked to Professor Chaudhary and kind of enticed him to take me on as a senior thesis student. And I kind of worked on traffic flows, the statistical mechanics of traffic flows with him uh, for my senior thesis. Another kind of rewarding experience around this time towards the end was uh, doing a summer research project with Satya Majumdar, uh, who was at the Tata Institute for Fundamental Research in Bombay at that time. And uh, I worked on phase ordering kinetics in parts models. Again, very mathy, statistical mechanics kinds of things. Uh, but you know, he was very generous. He, he basically you know, guided me into writing up the work that we had done and actually getting it published. And so you know, he was very generous with his time and I really appreciated that. I got my first taste for academic you know, paper writing and publishing. And uh, I actually, at that point, was you know really thrilled about StatMec, and that's what I wanted to do for grad school. But Satya was the one who said, you know, you need to think more broadly. There's things like soft condensed matter, you know, and applying all of these ideas to different real materials would be useful. And so, and then he also recommended the University of Chicago as an awesome place to go. And so, therefore, uh, that is where I ended up for my grad school at the U Chicago. I have to say I had a really wonderful time, great friends, you know, lots of fun activities, classes were great, the atmosphere was fantastic, weather not so great, but apart from that, everything was perfect. I met my future wife, Anthony Ghosh there, and this is us uh, at our wedding ceremony, and incidentally, it's our wedding anniversary today, so there's that as well, coincidentally. Uh, but moving on to academics, I worked with a couple of people before settling in with Tom Whitten as my PhD advisor. And he was really a marvelous, marvelous advisor. Um, he was there whenever I needed him to be there and he was completely hands off and I didn't. Uh, you know, I had kind of full freedom to choose the problems that I needed to work on. And so it is a wonderful experience. It's there that I really learned to collaborate with experimentalists. Uh, learn about interesting problems from talking to them. And so several of the problems that I worked on during my PhD were actually problems that just started as fun conversations with experimentalists. And a couple of them that I did were with David Greer, who was there at the time. And he's been a fun, wonderful mentor uh, and supporter ever since. Uh, but towards the end of my PhD was when I took my first ever course uh, on biophysics. Uh, it was the first time it was offered in the department as well. And again, I was kind of blown away by this new thing, which is like, you could use a physicist toolkit to understand something as complex as living systems, which I figured was kind of impossible, but seemed like you could actually say something useful. And so then I was like, okay, this is something that I really need to uh, pursue. Uh, but then, you know, it was time to graduate. And then we had to deal with the two body problem. So my wife and I were both looking for postdocs at the same time. So um, at that time, uh, Sai had lined up a post, a really great offer at UCSB. We shared a couple of others and I had a bunch of offers on the East Coast, but there was no place where we both had offers. And so I am forever grateful to Andrea Liu and Phil Pincus who actually got together, pooled their resources and basically made up a position for me. All right, and so, and I could actually be at UCSB and UCLA uh, and be together with my wife. So that was really fantastic. Of course, UCSB is great, uh, both UCLA and UCSB, great environments, fantastic people. This picture here is kind of pointing to where my office was in UCSB, you know, nothing to complain about, even the weather was perfect. So, um, so what it, 
while I was there, you know, I, again, both of Andre and Phil were fantastic advisors. They have, again, a lot of freedom to choose my own problems. Um, and I learned a lot from them about, you know, how to approach biological problems, because the first time I was actually delving into biophysics, I learned about how to learn from the biological literature, identifying the important physics in these biological problems, and then really about how to talk to biologists, uh, real biologists. So that was really eye-opening for me. And I worked on a number of different problems during my postdoc, you know, related to actin cytoskeletal dynamics, how cell shape was governed by the dynamics of these cytoskeletal filaments, uh, looked at polymer translocation through pores and in cellular crowded environments and so on. But again, you know, all good things also come to an end and it was time to, uh, you know, to address the dreaded two body problem now at the faculty job search level, which as you might imagine was uh, quite a bit tougher. Um, so I, the thing is that we were kind of open and upfront about it, and which I still believe is the best way to do it. Uh, and, uh, but again, there were very few places that could make offers to both of us, joint offers, uh, joint faculty offers. And one of those places was this, uh, the University of California at Merced, which is a campus that had just opened, the 10th campus in the UC system, and opened in 2005. And this picture on the left at the top is how it looked. Uh, and so it was actually under construction when we interviewed and the campus wasn't even open when we actually accepted our offers there. So, you know, it was kind of like a leap of faith uh, or foolishness, depending on who you talk to at the time. Um, but, you know, it had a couple of hundred students and a few dozen faculty at the time and just kind of two in physics. Uh, so, but it's been a while since then, 14, 15 years. And this picture in the middle is kind of what it looks like. This is just a small section of the campus now. And just for reference, the bridge at the top left is the same as the bridge over here. So you can just see what has happened. Um, so a huge expansion is about 9,000 students now. In physics, we have kind of 21 faculty. So we went from two to 21. That's been um, 65 graduate students. We have, you know, we are focused in kind of biophysics, soft matter physics as one focus area, and then we have another focus area on quantum materials and quantum information, broadly speaking. And then we are expanding into astrophysics as well right now. So, but looking back, you know, across all these years, you know, building, especially in the early years, right? We were junior faculty just out of postdoc. So building a department from scratch, including designing and implementing graduate and undergraduate programs, as well as courses, specific courses, you know, coming up with strategies for what research areas to focus in, our faculty hiring in, coming up for strategies on how to build those areas, um, actually going out and doing all the hiring, setting up policies and procedures, getting approvals for programs, all of this, while at the same time trying to set up your independent research labs, you know, teaching and training new students. Well, in the first year, we didn't even have any students. So, so all of these things, you know, it was pretty intense at the time. Uh, and, you know, it could be quite, it was quite difficult at some times. So, but I think in retrospect, uh, this may be obvious, but kind of the trick to getting through all of that was, um, you know, not being overwhelmed by the kind of gulf or gap between where we were at the point, at that point in time, whereas where we wanted to be or where we don't think it should be, right? And, or even, comparing to other faculty, you know, our peers at other institutions. So rather than being overwhelmed by that, actually working creatively and flexibly on smaller goals that are, you know, achievable and thinking about those was actually what I think what got us through. I think another aspect, you know, this that got us through was having kind of a collegial atmosphere, but, you know, having a shared vision among all of your colleagues was actually very, very, very important, I think. So that's another thing. And then finding a reason for your program building efforts to be meaningful to you personally, I think is also something that cannot be discounted and you know, it gives you some motivation to do these things. So, and UCM provided this because it's you know, situated in the San Joaquin Valley in California, which is kind of underserved, it both educationally, socially, and economically underserved region. And that's reflected in the demographics of our students as well. They're like 65% underrepresented groups and 
like 75 percent first gen college goers and so on and so the the idea that our efforts could actually help with social mobility among these uh, populations was really kind of motivating and so i think that also helped us through these years so of course then going back to research you know again there was this really uh biased random walk of topics. I wandered through intracellular transport, disordered proteins, started working on bacterial cytoskeletal proteins and cell shape, uh, motivated by a post uh, sabbatical I did with Casey Wong at Stanford, looked at collective migration and many, many other things, even in seemingly unrelated things like infant vocalizations. And these are driven, you know, again, by chance conversations, uh, uh, and actually the interests of students have driven many of these projects. So I was led by my students' interests. So with uh, that, I think I'm done. And so I'll just stop and say thanks to everyone. Of course, my students, first of all, uh, who have been doing all this work, you know, putting their faith in me as an advisor. Uh, and so without them, I wouldn't be able to do any of this. Thanks, of course, to this kind of constellation of stellar collaborators here. I've tried to include as many as I can of recent and collaborators. Um, it's just, you know, impossible to do it without them. And of course, family, I should thank. I mean, this has been uh, something that, you know, keeps you grounded, gives you perspective. And I think it's been the reason I've been able to get through all of these years. So thanks to all of these people and thank you for listening. So I'll stop there. Uh, thank you so much, Ajay. Um, of, for, for this fantastic Living Histories talk. Um, would one or two of you have burning, who have burning questions step up and ask them? Uh, I have a question. Go for it. Yes. Uh, thanks again for a fantastic talk. And I have a question. So uh, you work on a really wide uh, range of topics that are seemingly this, you know, they don't, they're, it's hard it's to find a Yes, um, you can see. <laughs> yes, and I was just wondering if you have any advice for early career uh, people who um, also work on a variety of topics that seemed disconnected and coming up with a, a theme for their research um, yeah. that they could use for, for fellowships and things like this. Yeah, so, you know, I have been asked this question before, uh, a long time ago. I will tell you who it was actually. So, oh, is this being recorded? Maybe I should tell you who it was. Uh, but let me just say my response to, and I'll just tell you after. Um, okay. My response was just that, you know, you should, yes, there's, it's a balancing act, right? Like you should do what you feel passionate about, right? Because if you're gonna try to attempt to do things simply for the purpose, let's say of getting a grant or positioning yourself, so that, you know, either for tenure letters or any other administrative considerations, you don't get derive the same joy out of what you do. So, but, you know, it is a balancing act to be sure to be able to do, th and, and the advice I gave was that if you look hard enough, there is some thread that connects these things because it is you who is choosing to do these problems. And there's probably something attractive about those problems that's drawing you to them. So I think if you can discover what that kernel of you know, commonality is, you can amplify that. And I think that's the advice I gave, so. Um, Thank you. Thanks, Arit. Uh, Ajay, I'm gonna ask a super quick question, uh, 60 seconds for answer. Um, I see that in your, in, in your narrative arc that there is a very sort of fluid boundary between service and work work. Um, and so would you comment on, you know, feeding the soul versus feeding the mind and how you ba manage that balancing act? Right. Um, so I guess I should say that uh, mine was kind of unique situation in that, that the service that I had to do had to be done. So like there was nobody else to do it. It was not like it was, you know, there was, I mean, without that, you wouldn't have, like if I, we didn't put that service in, we wouldn't have a graduate program. We wouldn't have an undergraduate. So that's, so it is not a question of choice. And so, you know, we adapted to that. Uh, and so trying to maintain that boundary, 
was you know finding motivation for the service that was meaningful i think that was the trick and i think i mentioned that before and so it's not i had we had to do the service that was required we had to do it at a level that made it worthwhile doing it uh, but keeping in mind you know you had to do your research i'm the research suffered a little bit for sure uh, but i think if the other stuff is rewarding enough to make up for that i think that's how you it's all it's kind of personal right the where you draw the line so but of course as chair now i would never dream of giving my junior faculty even a tenth of that amount of service so right so now that we are at a steady state we can do those things but yeah so.